K family is grieving the loss of a daughter and sister more than a year after her fatal overdose. While the man charged with her murder was sentenced today, they know that's just the start of the change that's needed to handle the region's growing drug epidemic. Northern News Now's Briggs LaSavage shares their story. Welcome to the Super Midnight Late Show with Corinne and Jackson, starring Corinne and Jackson. For a lot of people, Corinne Sorensen was the star of the show. I always say she was my Goldie Hawn. She was honestly a real bright light, really goofy. <laughs> yeah. It was always interesting. She's more of a wild card. Marching to the beat of her own drum. She was a trendsetter. While finding joy in every little bit of her life. Hockey, she loved horseback riding. She's a really good drawer. Very good drawer. <laughs> a life that tragically took a turn when Corinne was just 16 years old. That's when it started. But I couldn't really tell then, you know, it was running around and doing whatever, coming home late, but she was coming home, going to bed. Corinne's drug use wasn't always noticeable to her family, but quickly started taking a deep toll. One that her brother, Connor Sorensen, says was nearly impossible to come out of on her own. I know that she didn't want that life, but... No, she didn't. I know the drugs kind of... Whatever those things that she was doing, they really have a hold over people, and it's, it's terrible. With a little help, Corinne got clean, even celebrating six months of sobriety at one point. But sadly, the substances continued to call. She worked her ass off. She got clean for quite a while, but... Kind of goes to show if you don't, um, you know, stay with a good group to kind of keep you in those positive um, tendencies, you can slip back into the wrong ones really easily. Her mother, Carrie Sorensen, right. says it was January 2022 when Corinne really fell yeah, back into that. bad habits. Well, said, Around the same time, her family says she married a man who drug her down into a deep hole. According to court documents, on Thursday, January 27th, he and Corinne went to a home in Proctor to buy drugs from her dealer, Carter Gallo. According to Corinne's husband, who was quoted in those court documents, she took those drugs over the next couple days. But by Saturday, Corinne had died at just 22 years old. Medical examiners blaming it on the presence of edazolam and fentanyl in her system. It shouldn't have ever happened. Mm -mm. Should have never happened because Gallo, the man who sold her those drugs, was in the middle of serving three years probation for a different felony drug conviction. That sentence, which did not include prison time, stemmed from an incident in June 2019 when police raided Gallo's Duluth home and found drugs, body armor, and guns. Gallo also had two prior drug convictions before that leaving Corinne's family with so many questions. I don't understand how it's a revolving door. What are they gonna do for these people that are killing people every time they're out because they wanna make a quick dollar, you know? Nothing's changing. It's just it's reoccurring. It's gotta be harsh. It can't be where it's, oh, we're gonna give you a ticket this time. You, they, you catch them again, especially with like fentanyl or something like that, they're going to treatment, not for 30 days. They're going to treatment for a year going to go so that they can come back and be productive in our society. Whether it be reformed penalties, education, or stronger and longer rehab requirements, Corinne's family wants to see change. Change Judge Robert Friday hopes starts now. So nobody's denying that Corinne had an issue, along with millions of others in the United States right now. But in this instance, an individual that sought to profit from that disorder gave her a substance that took her life. And for that, there must be responsibility. Now charged with third-degree murder for Corinne's death, Gallo was sentenced to more than 11 years in prison Monday. A sentence her family feels is a start to holding offenders like Gallo accountable, but they hope it doesn't stop there. It's closure for us, but yet it's, it's still opening up other doors just to... Um, just to try to find different ways and where we can come together and and put a stop to this, or put a dent in it. We're just losing way too many young people. While still painful even today, Corinne's family hopes her death will bring the growing drug epidemic and its evolving challenges into the spotlight and bring hope to others fighting addiction. You have so many people that love you and there's even more that will support you and just reach out to them because I can promise you and after all this that you have 
friends, you have a family, you have neighbors, you have people that want to see you in this world and succeed and be a part of our community in a healthy way. In Cloquet, Briggs La Savage, Northern News Now. We have a list of resources for folks battling addiction at northernnewsnow.com. We want to stress that Corinne's family doesn't blame Gallo 100% on this. Corinne's mom says she holds both herself and Corinne accountable for her actions, along with Corinne's husband. Now, Corinne's mom and brother questioned the man Corinne married in the weeks before her death and the negative influence they say he had on her life. They claim if not for him, they'd still have Corinne here today. And we also reached out to the St. Louis County Court System for this story to learn more about the rate at which convicted drug dealers reoffend and what should be done to stop that from happening. They declined an interview for this report, saying they aren't able to comment on a specific case. They did offer to do an interview next month, which happens to be National Drug Court Month. As St. Louis County has its own drug court, which is a five-phase program meant to reduce reoffending rates. It's a treatment-based approach coupled with intensive supervision and judicial oversight to help people stay sober. And meanwhile, local law enforcement says the state of Minnesota has the right penalties in place for drug offenders, but in some cases they need to be enforced more often. The Lake Superior Violent Offender Task Force is responsible for arresting people who prey on those with substance abuse disorders. They serve St. Louis, Carleton, and Lake Counties, along with the City of Superior. Lieutenant Chad Nagorski leads the team. He says very rarely do they get someone with a large amount of narcotics who's a first-time offender. While Nagorski recognizes drug cases are full of circumstantial evidence and there are checks and balances within the court system for a reason, he knows many people his task force deals with are violent. I think that we have to stop focusing on the fact that they're drug offenders and focus on the fact that they're victimizing people and killing people. I think you've, I, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't have a problem with the fact that putting someone in prison for shooting somebody. Why do we have a problem putting the person in prison for almost committing death through giving them a substance that they die from? Nagorski says his department has a good relationship with the St. Louis County Attorney's Office, and through continued communication, they can hold some of these folks accountable. He added it wasn't long ago the drugs on the street weren't quite as potent, but with fentanyl coming on the scene, it's made drug use more deadly. For example, the Lake Superior Violent Offender Task Force reported 12 overdose deaths in their coverage area. Already this year, there have been 10, and they're projecting to end 2023 with 76. Now, he says fentanyl is a big driver here, since just 2 milligrams can kill a person. To put that in perspective, their task force recently arrested someone they called a prolific drug dealer who had 300 grams of fentanyl on him. That's enough to kill 150,000 people. And Nagorski says another difficult part of prosecuting these fatal drug cases each overdose death is investigated like a homicide, so it takes a lot of resources. While he knows they can't arrest their way out of a drug problem, they believe that through enforcement, education, and treatment, they can start to drive these numbers down.